Grace and peace are yours. From God, our Heavenly Father, and from your Lord and your Savior, Jesus Christ, who today we see fulfilling words of Scripture before our eyes, words that have become very familiar to us. And so, we hear the prophet say to us, Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. When's the last time you had that feeling of deja vu? Where you're in the middle of this scene in life that's unfolding around you, you, can, you can't really put your finger on it, and you know, I, I've been here before. I've been through something like this moment, like this, or even maybe this exact same moment. It feels as if that, that couldn't possibly be, be real because time travel isn't a thing, but it feels like it, right? Are you getting a little bit of that this morning? Because, well, last time we read the, an account of Jesus triumphantly riding into Jerusalem, it was the start of Holy Week. If you were here with us on that April Sunday morning, even up front we had the Steel Pan Band from Wisco here. Maybe you can still hear the echoes of that Sunday. Maybe the echoes afterwards of a certain member of ours ringing cowbells after the announcement that Pastor Paul was coming. <laughs> a triumphant day. And yet it's popping back up, not at the start of Holy Week, it will, but the start of a new church year. Maybe you've already gotten used to this because this is the third year in recent Salem history that we've gone back to using Palm Sunday, the Palm Sunday text, as our gospel lesson for the first Sunday in Advent. There's good reason for doing so. There, there's a reason why Lutherans historically have done this because we realize, you know what, this, this king who is coming, this king who we, long, who we long for, well, he came for a purpose. He came to be that savior king. That one who we would shout out, Hosanna! But if we could put ourselves actually in the sandals of those Palm Sunday worshipers, who were taking off their cloaks and laying them so that the donkey wouldn't even have to put its feet on dirt and taking those, branches, those palm branches and laying them and waving them in victory. I wonder if anyone there had a feeling of deja vu. I wonder if any of them were recalling their... Sabbath school where they had heard the prophecies of Zechariah which Matthew quotes which we've highlighted a couple times when Pastor Paul read the lesson in its entirety when I highlighted just before the start of our devotion this morning where Zechariah invites them to look for this event Say to daughter Zion, say, say to the people of this holy city, God's holy city, this temple mount of Zion, your king comes to you, gentle and having salvation, riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. I'm willing to bet there were people in that crowd that had those verses in their mind. That was stirring them up for this moment. These echoes from the prophet were living out in their own lives, and maybe, maybe, just maybe, their minds were going back to when they had studied these words. Maybe they had that, a flannel graph, like old Sunday school rooms used to have, something like that, not flannel graph, but something like that, where they depicted these events before their eyes to impress them. They, they would have memorized Scripture a lot more than, than we have our kids, my eighth graders, they, they complain every single time I set, us up, I set out the memory work for the next time we meet. But remember, they didn't have the written scriptures, at least at their fingertips like we did. If they wanted the scripture with them, they had to memorize it. They couldn't pull out their phone and go to BibleGateway.com. 
You had to be here and here with them at all times. And these echoes in their head and their heart now enacted in front of them. And if you dive in, there are a lot more familiar deja vu moments in this account. And that's on purpose. So this graphic that you see, the white kind of line that's going up and down the bottom, that represents every single chapter in the scriptures. The longer line, it's tough to see from where you're at, but if you see in the middle, there's a long line. That's Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible. So that's right, pretty much smack dab in the middle. And those arcs are every time that the, the, the people who put together this graphic found that there was a section of scripture that refers back to each other, connecting them from chapter to chapter. Now we're in the gospel today, we're in Matthew's gospel, so in the last third, we have that dip in the last third of it, that's roughly where the gospels are. And it gets darker, the color near those, because there are so many interconnected sections that go, reach all the way back to all sections of the Old Testament, and they refer back to each other in the Gospels. All of these words of prophecy being fulfilled over and over again before the people's eyes, because our God tells us that, you know what? Scripture cannot be broken. And Jesus fulfilled all of it. His entire life was an echo of words said in the past, preparing the people to know what was going to happen when he entered into Jerusalem. They were supposed to have been so familiar with all these events. They should have been. You'd think they would be. And it seems as if they are. It seems like they're prepared for that moment. There shouts of Hosanna, that, that beautiful word which we still use. And if you don't know what it actually means, it means save us now. They're shouting this, recognizing they need a savior. The echoes from the past are informing this moment that might very well have seemed like deja vu as they're worshiping. They seem to know this Jesus guy who has been ministering for three years is a big deal. Worth their time. Worth their attention. We know that too, don't we? That's why you're gathered here on the first Sunday in Advent. That's why so many of you are you're here week in, week out. And maybe to you, this scene from Palm Sunday is deja vu. You know it, you've heard it. But I pray that you haven't been tuning out. Because those cries of Hosanna are our cries too. Lord, save us now. Even though we know that the events of this day, the events of Jesus' birth. All those culminated in that Savior going to the cross so that he could enact our salvation, so he could save us now. How many times do we let this deja vu that we experience in the worship service allow us to kind of tune out because, you know, I've been through this. I know what's going on. I can go through the motions. If you're, new to, if you're new to Salem, and if this is new to you, good. This style of worship, going through the liturgy, hearing these words of prophecy, that's why we use liturgical style worship, because we have those echoes from the past. We have those words of Scripture. The liturgy is just filled with words that God has told us to speak back to Him. Nearly all of the words we use in our responses, they're they're taken, lifted off of the pages of Scripture so that we could speak them to each other, encourage one another, so that we could have these moments of deja vu where we see how everything in Scripture is interconnected to tell the story of Jesus, 
how all those prophecies of the one who will be born in Bethlehem, who we're preparing ourselves for, culminated in the one who marched into Jerusalem so that he could save his people. All of this is for a purpose, and I hope that you're as excited as those Palm Sunday worshipers were, because I am. We're, we're getting to this point where we get to once again marvel at the fact that God took, not only that God died, but to get to that point, he had to become a baby. He had to take on flesh and blood and be descended from the royal throne of David. That's why those shouts are also so important when they cry out, Hosanna to the son of David. These crowds had a recognition that this is the one who is from David. This messianic title. The one who, David, he said, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. And how can David, how can David, who is the king, say the Lord said to my Lord, how can David have a, a Lord who would come from his own line if it wasn't God in flesh? This is the great, great, great grand grandson that David was waiting for. This is the one that all of Israel was waiting for. This is the one that you and I look back to and we say, thank you for saving us, son of David. This king who comes to us so that he can set everything right. This king who comes to us so that he can provide for us exactly what we need. Yes, yeah, so that he can provide for you your, your Thanksgiving meal that I hope you enjoyed with family or friends. So that you can enjoy the get-togethers that are coming in the coming month. So that you are warm, hopefully, this time of year. So that you are pro well provided for but even more, this king who came to you, answering that call for salvation by willingly fighting your battle as a king should, going to war on your behalf, not marching to war on a donkey. That was his pre-victory parade. But when he truly went to battle for you, mounting a cross, so that he could endure what you deserve, so that he could actually be the king who saves. All of these things, echoes from Scripture, piling up to that moment where our God took on flesh and blood, all so that he could be our king, who wins salvation for us. You and I know exactly who Jesus is. I, I pray that we do. We have the benefit of having the scriptures always before us, all the New Testament. We can have those graphics like I showed you where we see the connections. You can have study Bibles that have references, cross-references that tell you, okay, you want to dive a little bit more into this, to, to this teaching? Well, go back here. Go back to this prophet. There's a reason why in the bulletin you saw the reference to Zechariah 9 in the gospel reading because it's saying hey point this point my people back to this it's all connected it all points to the fact that this jesus he is our king he is the promised messiah and yet the people who worship on that first palm sunday they didn't really know at this event we're told that Jerusalem was stirred. It, it kind of brings to mind when Herod heard about the news of Jesus, Jesus' birth, and he wanted, he wanted to put down this new king that was born. And now this king has grown up, and he's entering into the capital city. And Jerusalem, once again, is stirred because of Jesus. The crowds ask, who is this? And they don't come forward with that beautiful, this is the Christ, the son of the living God, that Peter said when 
Jesus asked him, who do you say that I am? But the crowds go back to giving Jesus the title, oh, this is the prophet from Nazareth and Galilee. Yeah, it showed that they understood this is a man who carries God's word. But if they were reliving those portions of scripture that they had learned in years past, they missed the lesson. The world still today wants to make Jesus just, just that, a prophet, a teacher. And at times we might be thinking, well, at least they're giving him a little bit of credit. We shouldn't be content with that. We know that this is the king who answered our cries for Hosanna to save us. We know this is the one who literally moved heaven and earth to take on flesh and blood, to come into this creation that he formed at the beginning of time, to redeem it, to save it, to claim it as his own forever. He deserves to be proclaimed as much more than just a prophet. And so as we prepare to celebrate his birth, knowing that he would come to save us. If this world asks you, who is this Jesus? Because this world is stirred about this news about Jesus. Whether or not they did it or not, they've got to find, they've got to come face to face with him. And you who have the deja vu of Sunday schools past, of worship services past, ringing in your mind, telling you who this Savior is. Let that inform your answer. That this Jesus is the Savior of the world. The one who is both God and man. The one who came so that we could have peace with our God forever. The one who came so that the salvation he brings means we don't need to worry about whether or not we've been a good enough person, about whether or not we're on naughty or nice list, but that we have a king who has done everything to protect us, his people, to claim us as his own, to make sure that we are with him forever. So I pray that the familiarity of lessons like the Palm Sunday Gospel, of the Christmas Gospel that we'll hear soon enough, that you take pleasure in how familiar they are to you and how it feels as if you've lived through them because of those that have taught them to you in the past. But those inform you. And people ask, who is this Jesus? Amen. Please stand.